Hi, everybody, and welcome back to Talk Gnosis. This is our fourth and final part of our conversation with Richard Hodges on the Gnosis of Gurdjieff. Thanks again to Bishop Lady Peterson for filling in for Jonathan. Last time we talked about Kunda Buffer, Food for the Moon, Bills Above's Tales to His Grandson, and more. If you hadn't uh, watched that and uh, any of those words sound weird to you, I recommend going back and watching part three before we carry on to part four. We also talk about, talked about symbols and metaphors and the Law of Seven. In this part, we kind of continue where we left off with the Law of Seven. We talk about the Law of Three and the Law of Seven and how those things relate to the Enneagram diagram. We talk about movement as a spiritual practice in the Gurdjieff system and some of their sacred dances that they do. And we talk about the fourth way and Gnosticism. And then, of course, at the end, stick around. We give some book recommendations and some ways to get started in the fourth way if you're interested in doing that. So we hope you enjoy this fourth and final part of our conversation with Richard Hodges, The Gnosis of Gurdjieff. How does this, uh, how does this relate to the Enneagram? if I'm saying that correctly. Yes. Uh, the Enneagram is a, a diagram, uh, many of your readers probably know what it looks like, and on which the laws of three and the laws of seven can be can be diagrammed, and, and it's possible to make many different connections and uh, understand things in a new way by using it as, a, as again, a symbol, a symbolic diagram. It, in that way, it functions a little bit like perhaps the Tree of Life, the, the Sephiroth in Kabbalah, or the Sri Yantra in uh, in Hinduism, mm -hmm. Hindu tradition, and and uh, mandalas in Tibetan Buddhism. That you you can ponder and contemplate uh, uh, and relate these diagrams to one's own inner experience and to outer life and perhaps uh, perhaps raise raise the level uh, at which life appears in, in your mind to to a more cosmic level another function of the Enneagram is many of Gurdjieff's movements are based in one way or another on the Enneagram uh, and this this is too intricate uh, <laughs> and too private to go into but uh, he says somewhere that you don't understand the Enneagram until you know it in motion. And, mm -hmm. and this is partly a reference to these movements in which you move in patterns determined by the, the Enneagram. Now, one other thing has to be said. There's a, a whole bunch of people around that teach something about the Enneagram as a personality system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This was not something that Gurdjieff ever taught, at least not certainly not in anything like the form in which uh, it's taught. This was kind of made up by someone whose name I'm not even going to use on the air. And it got taken up by certain other people, some of whom I know whose name I'm also not going to use on the air. But they, they turned it into a business, basically. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wouldn't touch it with a 10-foot pole. Uh, so anytime anybody mentions Enneagram, it, it sets off alarm, yeah. uh, <laughs> alarm bells. Because Gurdjieff meant something very special by it, and it's being uh, debased and turned into something very uh, uh, low. By, yeah. yeah. Hmm. Commercial, low. Yeah. There's, a, there's, a, there's a whole industry around it. A whole industry, yeah. Uh, and it panders to a certain need for people to explain, oh, you know, what type of person should I... Should I have as a as a mate or something like that? Yeah, everybody wants to know that. Maybe I'm skeptical of uh, yeah. yeah. I'm skeptical of all those personality type right. things in general. Right. Right. It's I, all it's all cold reading and <laughs> you right. know generalities. I remember right. coming first coming into the work and there was a we were discussing different levels of the way people operated and there's some some lingo in the work uh, man number one man number two number number three man number one is in the body uh, influenced most by the body but you have man number two uh, the emotions man number three the intellect and and people in the group started in on this whole thing well am I one or two or three? <laughs> and eventually one of our leaders said, you know, I'm not crazy about people talking like this. Right. And I, I chipped in and I said, I'm not seeing, you know, I think we, this panders to the ego. It's like taking a quiz yeah. in the back of Cosmopolitan magazine <laughs> about what your, right. your sex style is or, you know, what right. your exactly. uh, 
yeah. home decor style is. And um, there was a pandering to the ego that happens. Oh, I'm special. This is me. And now I now I know myself. No, the the process of self knowledge is incredibly painful, and it takes a long time. Well, the real message of of the man number one, two, three, four, and so on is against the ego because if you read further, he says that man number one, two, and three are all on the same level, which is a very low level, and that <laughs> the aim of of our work is to become man man number four, which is a person with a permanent center of gravity, and. And I have to say also that one one of our teachers back in the day, when people said, "Oh, are we getting uh, to man number? Uh, are we in man number four yet?" <laughs> he would say, "No, we're we're still working on three and a half." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so. in the in Martinism, they have the uh, the man of the stream and the man of desire. Right. And, you know, and it's it's the same kind of thing. It's like yeah, you same know, kind of thing. you yeah. get to say. Oh, look at those people of the stream over there. Yeah, who cares what yep, they have to sure. say? It's, a, it's, it's used as a weapon. Exactly. Yeah. And that's a good way of putting it, Father. Mm -hmm. You mentioned, um, you, you mentioned uh, some, uh, uh, practice, some practical method of movement, and uh, you kind of implied also that it was private. Uh, does that have to do with... Um, uh, the private teachings of, of specific groups, or is there a kind of generalized um, uh, sacred movement, something or other, that happens in, in Gurdjieff's work? There's a practice of uh, where people do, the, sometimes called sacred dances, sometimes called the Gurdjieff movements, uh, together in a, in a group ranging from six to 40 people, um, usually led by an experienced person and almost always accompanied by music, uh, mm -hmm. preferably played on the piano, the music that Gurdjieff himself wrote and some of his close students. And uh, all of the movements have a very detailed and precise choreography that one has to learn, which mm -hmm. is make certain demands, uh, both physical demands and uh, demands of the attention to remember what order mm -hmm arms and legs and so forth and calculate the Enneagram and most importantly though the demand of to be present and to be really in the body uh, and in movement which is not which is often not what people do and also to uh, to be totally in the room to have one's thoughts not venture an inch outside this movement, this exercise, this mm -hmm. dance, sacred dance that one is doing. And at first, that's extremely difficult for people, but it, you, you gradually begin to realize how necessary it is, the, the, the least distracting thought. And you, you forget where you are in the movement, for example, mm -hmm. or, or it becomes meaningless because you no longer have the, the sensation of that particular vibration that the movement is about. Hmm, that's very interesting. Is it, uh, would it be similar to something like a Tai Chi? It could be. Uh, of course, it's not usually music in Tai Chi. Right. And, but yes, it could, be, it could be a little bit like that. Mm -hmm. hmm. Also, some of, the, some, of the movement, the, some of the movements are merely exercises for the body and mind, but some of them are very deep uh, mm -hmm. uh, prayers even. Uh, yeah. Several of them are called prayers, and some of them have words that go with them, and also some of them have inner exercises that are not apparent to a, an external observer, but the way mm. in which the mind is connecting with certain parts of the body. Uh, I had no understanding of just how powerful that kind of, of work could be, and I am terrible at the movements, and I have a bad back, so I can only participate in them sometimes, but... Um, it, it's just extraordinary. The first thing I noticed when I took my first movements class, and I was the only person there who had never taken a movements class. Everybody else had been doing them for 10 years or something, or more, 10, 20, 30 years. Um, and in fact, the, the movements instructor was from out of town, came up afterwards and congratulated me for my bravery <laughs> and, right. and getting up there and doing this. But the first thing that made the impression on me, the first impression that I had was, if I trust the, mu the, the music, I will be better off. Yes. 
and this 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 music that was composed by Mr. Gurdjieff and Thomas de Hartman is extraordinary. And I realized I could trust this music, and it could help. Yes. It could help. And it's, it's extraordinary. The other thing that I began to learn was not just my inattention. And there was that certain sense of, inatten- you know, I could see my inattention, my inner nothingness, my inability to follow what looks to be very simple movements. But I also got to see some other aspects of me that I didn't really want to acknowledge. I, I mm. did one movement once where um, there was an extra movement or after a pause there was an extra movement it was a very brief pause no more than a second but for some reason in my mind and body i had decided that the movement ought to end before that final beat or that but before that right. final movement and i found myself becoming resentful that i had to do that extra movement and it showed me hmm. my own inner laziness and right. i realized i was getting angry because and this repeatedly happened over numerous times and I, I began to see my own inner laziness and my pet, how petty I am and how much energy I waste on really what was no more than a second of my time. Yes. So it's one of the most powerful experiences I ever had, and I, you know, these are my experiences, but when we're talking about the body and how the, the system, the work, works with the body, I have found some of my strongest lessons have come through that kind of work with the body. Mm-hmm. These are very good examples you're giving. That's, uh, <laughs> there seems to be, I guess there's a, there's a reason why there are uh, groups and things, because uh, a, uh, a lot of spiritual systems you can pretty much do in your living room, but th- this definitely seems like something that <laughs> it requires a lot of help. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's very interesting. And the conditions, I mean, one of the things, I, I, and Richard, tell me if I'm wrong, but one of the aphorisms, I believe, was we cannot help, we can only create conditions. Yes, right. Mm-hmm. And it, it, a lot of the work that is done in the groups and the foundation, I'm the part of the foundation here in Chicago, is creating these conditions. And in some ways, these are very practical things. We own, our, our group owns two properties, one here in the city and one out, really, in, it's, an, you know, it's a country property, it's actually an exurb. Um, but they require maintenance. Mm-hmm. And so we work in teams to keep these establishments going. We have a kiln, a pottery kiln, and a pottery team that make you know, beautiful pottery. But we have a lot of things that we work on together. When you're talking about it's not being done in your living room, it's actually being done in somebody else's or living room or actually mm-hmm. the living room of these houses uh, that we have for our instruction and learning. In fact, our exurb uh, property, the, the pole barn, the barn where we do the movements and have our communal meals and do a lot of work, was actually built by members of the foundation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the idea of conditions is includes all of that, and, and it's a very big idea because other people are the main condition that we have to work with. And the, the condition really is how do I sense and uh, the need of the other and support it. Mm-hmm. And that's that's a big help when you feel that, that we're, I'm very similar to you because we both have the same need and that we can, like you say, not exactly help each other, but we can support this sense of need. Mm-hmm. This is a, a, a definitely a condition. It's a, it's a big thing, uh, yeah. particularly when you're with people who you don't like. And one of the things that right. happens in the foundation is work is done typically in teams. Uh, even if the job could perhaps be more efficiently done by one person, <laughs> the work is typically right. done in teams. And you don't get a say in what team you're on or who who's on. You, typically you don't. I mean, there, there can be – I'm not going to go there. But – there are going to be situations in which you know you are going to be on a team of people who you do not know, who you do not like. This is not an efficient way of getting this job done. That's a condition. There's got to be a joke there somewhere about how many Gurdjieffians does it take to change a light bulb. <laughs> I actually gave you an answer once. Well, it's actually, yeah, the way I change my light bulbs, which is I let them all go run out, right. and then I run to the store and I get the wrong light bulbs, and I burn myself because I didn't turn right. off the, the life switch before putting them in, and yeah. Right. <laughs> so this, uh, that's interesting, these conditions, um, or the, the idea of 
um, you know, not being able to directly influence another person, um, but you know, hoping to set up conditions by which a person can come to self-realization. That strikes me as very similar to, I think, what we try and do in Gnosticism. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. let me take that tangent. Um, do you see any particular uh, similarities or overlaps between uh, the Gurdjieff work and Gnosticism in its either uh, historical incarnation or its modern one? Well, there's a couple of things to say there. Uh, Gnosticism with a big G, of course, has certain implications and meanings in terms of a tradition of theology and practice that goes back at, at least to the Essenes, as we now know from the Nag Hammadi texts. And the short answer is yes, there are some connections uh, with Gurdjieff's ideas uh, that are really hard to figure out exactly what they were, because as I've said, he was at great pains to hide his tracks. Mm -hmm. But yes, you can you can find some some connections. You you mentioned here the Demiurge. I, I would not really want to say that the Demiurge and the Kundabuffer are, are the same thing. Uh, but one but there is there is something that might resonate with Gnosticism. I don't know much about it, so I'm just guessing here, but there in Beelzebub there are numerous stories, maybe half a dozen or ten stories in the book, which all have the characteristic that some higher being or group of higher beings that were responsible for something on Earth or somewhere else in the cosmos m made serious mistakes, mm. mostly because they didn't pay attention to what was actually happening on the ground. <laughs> and uh, and the, the, creating the Oregon Kunda buffer is perhaps one of those, but there's, there's some other many other stories in, in the book. So it's not that they were these higher beings were necessarily malicious, like I believe the Demiurge, in a way, is taken to be, but they're more like uh, fools. <laughs> the, the keystone cops of the cosmos? Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> uh, and, and many of these stories have even, you'd say, world historical resonance, too, and he plays on that in the book a little bit. Uh, like you can see him saying that this and that bad thing that happened in history was due to some some mistakes by some high being somewhere. Uh, I won't I won't go into the details hmm. because certain people might get mad. But <laughs> 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 and besides, <laughs> it's for you to read and, and sure. yeah. tease out those things. All right, uh, wrapping things up here, um, if somebody wanted to learn more about Gurdjieff and his work, um, what's the uh, kind of entry-level thing that you would point him right. to, a book or uh, the foundation or, or what? Right. Well, I, I did. let me say just one more thing about Gnosis. Sure. Gnosis with a small g generally refers to an idea that one has to have some kind of direct knowledge uh, that is of a different nature than the ordinary knowledge that is taught in schools. And yes, that is very much an idea in uh, and a practice in, in Gurdjieff. So now, you, but so that I just wanted to say that. Sure. Where to start? Um, <clears throat> yes, reading some of the books is a good place. Even even reading the book by Uspensky, In Search of the Miraculous, it's, it's a great book. Mm -hmm. um, it's... A lot of people don't like it. A lot of people like it a lot. Uh, I'm in the latter camp. Uh, but it, it, it rewards reading and rereading and thinking about. Uh, Uspinski was, was uh, no small deal. He, When he met Gurdjieff, he was in Russia and could fill a hall of, with, uh, with a thousand people for a talk about esoteric matters. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, he had a very powerful mind, and he was a really good writer, yes. uh, and a and a good observer. Um, you know, he he only was with Gurdjieff for a relatively short time, and he left for reasons that are not totally uh, clear. But he didn't leave the connection with Gurdjieff, and many and he main, he kept these notes that he had taken while he was with Gurdjieff, and many years later he put them into the form of this book that I mentioned in Search of the Miraculous. And 
just before Gurdjieff died, he sent it to Gurdjieff, and Gurdjieff said, yes, this is, this is what I say. Mm. He said, I used to hate Uspensky, now I love him <laughs> for, for doing this. So, yes, read that book. And then, if you have the stomach for it, then there's Beelzebub's Tales <laughs> and, and his other two books, uh, Meetings with Remarkable Men, and Life is Real, Only Then When I Am, his third book. But probably probably before you get through with all of that, you if you're really interested, you would want to to meet a person uh, in in the flesh mm -hmm. that you could, you could speak to about this. And this is not so difficult. There are energy foundations uh, around around the world that, that are accessible. And if anyone wants to talk with me, I'm available. Uh, I don't know whether it's appropriate to give my email. Uh, it's up to you. If you want to, we yeah. can put it in the okay. show notes. Sure rbhodges at gmail.com. All right. And uh, I'm perfectly willing to, to talk and maybe refer you to somebody near where you are if, if that's what you want. Yeah, fantastic. So uh, I know that uh, over the course of this, uh, this talk, we have, we, we have a lot to think about. <laughs> we do. Good, and, uh, good. Yeah, we, I, I really appreciate your, your time and your, your expertise here. Uh, Thank you so much for joining us on this show. Well, I've, en I've enjoyed it. It uh, made me face myself a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, you know, we aim to please. Right. <laughs> and thank you, Bishop Laney, for filling in for Jonathan. I really appreciate I'm you stepping in last minute. It was a real pleasure. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. I hope you enjoyed the fourth and final part of our conversation with Richard Hodges on the Gnosis of Gurdjieff. Uh, if you enjoyed this series, please subscribe to our YouTube channel or to our podcasts uh, via the relevant links in all of the relevant places. You don't want to miss any of our new and interesting content that's coming out all the time. Uh, we release a new episode every week, and, uh, and we hope that you enjoy it and you will listen to us and watch us all the time. Um, if you did enjoy this and you got some value out of it, we hope that you would consider becoming a patron over on our Patreon crowdfunding campaign. Uh, your support helps us to grow and do more and better content and to hire staff to do the uh, grunt work and things that is hard to do in, pre in preparing uh, educational content for, uh, for all of you. So please do check out patreon.com slash Gnostic. Uh, the link will be in the descriptions and all of the relevant places. Um, and, uh, and we hope that you would consider becoming a patron because your support is very important to us and we really appreciate it. Uh, uh, we're not quite sure what our next round of episodes is going to be. We haven't recorded them yet, but uh, we, uh, we know they're going to be fantastic. So stick around, make sure you subscribe, and uh, we will see you next time on Talk Gnosis.